evening. Good evening. We've slain the purple demons yet once again, and the technology seems to be ready to go. Uh, welcome to our, what is it, third, I guess, uh, monthly lecture. And I'm honored tonight to welcome Matushka Miho Ili. And uh, there's a bio on your table, so I won't bother to reread what is already there for you to read. Uh, not only do we get much to be here tonight, but of course we have her husband, Father Gregory, serving with me tonight during Presentified, and their cute little daughters right here in the front. All right, so we welcome the whole family uh, joining us all the way from Dayton, Ohio. So they get probably the long distance award for people who are here tonight anyway. Um, so without any further ado, uh, I will welcome Matushka Vito to start her presentation on orthodoxy in Japan. And I can't think of a more well-qualified person <laughs> to teach us about that tonight. Okay. Well, thank you. Thank you. Good evening. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Father Gregory. It's a bit confusing because my husband is Father Gregory and then there's another father. So, yes, yes. And thank you so much, Father. Um, and yes, I'm very, I'm very grateful that that we're here tonight because it's been raining and the you know road trip with two small children that's not easy as you know so yes and yes and um, the Sachs have graciously offered their house to host us this time so yes thank you so much okay so orthodoxy in Japan I will so I'd like to present some facts about the church the Orthodox Church in Japan tonight. And as you can see in this big picture, I, have to, I, did, I, I didn't bring a, you know, any laser kind of thing, so. <laughs> this is my hometown. This is the Orthodox Church, in, uh, the, the first Orthodox Church in Japan. Yeah, my, my home is somewhere that way. <laughs> and then, this is called Mount Hakodate, mm -hmm. and on the foot of the mountain, there's a church. So I will introduce church, church in Japan tonight. Okay, so before we talk a little bit more about it, I'd like to explain who I am. So my name is Miho Chiaili. In church, I'm Yalagiya. So my my husband is Father Yili, and we have two girls, Nino, eight years old, and Mila, six years old. And I'm born and raised in Hakodate, Japan. So the, the, the picture that you just saw at the very beginning, that's my hometown. And I will explain where it's located and what, it, you know, what it's like there later. So I grew up as an Orthodox Christian in Japan. And um, I studied some more like theology, religious studies, at the school called Dosisha, and um, I was in school at Orthodox, Orthodox School of Patriarch at Katsunan Orthodox Institute in Berkeley, and I went to Loyola University. I had master's in pastoral studies from Loyola, Chicago, and I'm, a, I'm trained as a hospital chaplain. And I'm, I'm a member of OCA's clergy wife's advisory group, along with Sasha Yamacha. So, so I wear a lot of you know different hats. I direct the choir, I boss people around, I tell people you know what to do, prostration now, things like that. But, but, but first and foremost, I, I grew up as an Orthodox Christian in Japan and it, it was just uh, unusual, you know? As you can imagine, Japan is not a Christian country to begin with. What is Easter? What is, you know, Christmas? Is that a holiday? Valentine's? Oh, let's get together for couples, you know? So that's, so growing up in Japan as an Orthodox Christian, I always knew I was a bit different. Me too. Me too. Okay. But, but um, no, nothing bad happened. Nobody said anything, you know, any, anything negative to me growing up. And but, so the, these pictures, that one on toward the right, my right, that's my church, my home parish. 
Holy Resurrection Orthodox Church in Japan. And then this is inside of the church. It's really, it's stunning. And it's a historical landmark of my hometown. It's, re it's so popular, every souvenir package you see, there is a holy, there is a church. Holy Resurrection <laughs> Orthodox Church. So people in Japan, or you know, or all you know, foreign visitors, they pick up a souvenir in Hakodate, and there's a church. So it's very popular, yet not many people know what orthodoxy is. Okay. So that's about me. So where is Hakodate? Yes, you see, it's up north, and. Lydia is a nurse. You've been to Hakodate? Okay. Okay. It's far. Now we have bullet train that goes under the under the sea from the mainland Honshu to Hokkaido. So from Tokyo, you can either take a airplane or bullet train. So orthodoxy in Japan really started in my hometown Hakodate back in 1858, with the arrival of the Russian consul and its stuff. So if you can, just above Hokkaido, the, the big island where Hakodate is. Hakodate is in the southernmost part of Hokkaido. But just north of Hokkaido, it's already Russia. You know, there's Sakhalin Island. So it's very close to Russia. And, um, so prior to the arrival of the Russians, Hakodate became one of the few international ports open to the foreign countries as a result of Japan-US Treaty of Amity and Commerce signed in 1854. So Hakodate was a, was a small town, small fishing town before that treaty was signed. But it became a crossroads of cultures after almost 300 years of isolation policy was enforced in, for the entire country. So I, you probably have you know, some idea that Japan was closed for most foreign countries, you know, for, for three centuries. So when once the, once the Japanese government decided to open a few ports in Japan, Hakodate was selected and all of a sudden, all these people from different countries, mainly US, France, England, and Russia, they came, and, and China. So major countries like those decided to establish consulates, consulates in, in, consulates in Hakodate. So here we are, oh, I'm sorry, there's a bit of a... So, toward the far right from me, the map of Hakodate soon after the port was opened. It, I know it's a bit, it's blurry and hard to see, but you see all these ships, they are all from different countries. And the dock, well, the part docked in the port of Hakodate, and Hakodate started developing from the foot of the mountain. So there were slopes, and then on those, uh, along those slopes, there were you know, houses, temples, consulates, and all these people lived around. So when the, the, when the, the Russian consul first came, first arrived, this man, his name is Yosef Antonovich Goshkevich, and that's his wife, Elizabeth. He's from Belarus. He's the first Russian consul to Hagodate. And he had a lot of influence on the establishment of church in Japan. So he was a son of priest. And he himself had a seminary grad, a seminary education. He went to seminary academia, so he had a you know higher education in, in theology. 
and languages. He was very talented in language, so he first became Chinese interpreter. Then he learned Japanese, and that was the that was the, the beginning of the, you know his journey. So he was appointed as a consul, and he he and his family and the consul staff, about fifteen people, traveled all the way from Russia to Hasselbeck. That was eighteen fifty, I'd, I'd say eight or nine. At, at the beginning, they, they had nothing. Right, there was nothing for you know prepared for them. So they had to live somewhere. Where could they live? That's the temple called Jitsugyoji Temple. That's the first residence for Russians in Hakodate till they were able to have their own property. <clears throat> so, so this temple still exists, and they do have some some historical you know, records in their archives that they had these visitors staying with them. So he, so this consul, Goshkevich, Mr. Goshkevich, he, because of his theological background, he knew one day when it was allowed, we could bring the gospel to Japanese people. But he was waiting, you know, because <coughs> The, the, any missionary work was not allowed yet. So he was waiting, but he, of course, with, his, with, the, with them, there was a priest, Russian Orthodox priest, that came along with them. So the first priest, his name was um, Father Yoshif Makhov. And he and his um, son-in-law, they worked really hard to translate, you know, basic Russians to Japanese. So they had different, you know, like simple slogan, um, dictionary for the Japanese people and Russians. But the first priest, Father Mako, he was he was not he was little he was sick he got sick and he was sent back to he he decided to go go back to Russia. So they needed another priest to the cons consulate, somebody attached to the consulate. So what happened, Mr. Goshkevich made a request to the, the, the Russian church to send somebody from Russia, somebody who is young, healthy, strong, eager, and willing to come all the way to Japan. So. So that's how that's how we have the Saint Nikolai of Japan. So this is Father Nikolai Kasatke in Hakodate when soon after he arrived in Hakodate in 1861. And that's the that's the first church building, Holy Resurrection Church, within the consulate property. So probably many people now at least you know have, have heard of Saint Nikolai of Japan. He did amazing work, and I, which I will explain. But he he was very educated and had so much faith in not only God but in you know the the church itself that. There's something that he needs to do. And he was always looking for that something. And when he heard about this um, position in Japan, he couldn't wait to really apply. His, his professors, they tried to dissuade him because he was a good student. He was really good. Apparently he spoke you know, multiple languages, he excelled in academics, so that and he was at St. Petersburg Academy, and uh, he was he was a star student. So the teachers first tried to dissuade him, like, oh no no no, we we, we want you to stay, we want you to become, you know, to, to teach here, we want you to be here. Yes. <coughs> was one of Father Nikolai's <coughs> languages mm. Japanese? No, he never.
never studied Japanese before coming to Japan. Yes. So he studied like a, you know, all the Hebrew, Greek, Latin, German, French, English. But he never studied any um, Oriental languages like that. He didn't know any Chinese, he didn't know any Japanese prior to his coming. Well, he was convinced that he had to go. He had to be the one to go to Japan. So I put 12 candidates, but I think some 12, 15 people were interested for, to become, you know, to be a priest, a pastor, a consulate in, in Hakodate. And he got selected, smaller, smaller group, and among, among there were four people, last candidates, and he was one of them. And all of them, well-educated, very knowledgeable, very, you know, willing, but um, I think he really stood out because he was young and tough. You need that kind of person, you know, to do this, to do all the traveling. Going to Japan, it took a year for him to go to Japan. One year. He left August 1860, 6-0. He left, I think he left Russia, August, August 1860. And he arrived in Next, the summer, following the summer after, so 1861, he arrived in Hakodate. So he worked in that church as a priest, as the consulate. And first 80 years of him living in Hakodate, he dedicated himself, his time, to learn the, the, the language, Japanese language and the culture. How, how people lived. Because that was the, that was an advice, there was an advice coming from St. Innocent of Alaska, who we commemorated just you know, past Sunday. So on the way, when he was traveling for the first time to Japan, on the way to Japan, he had an opportunity to meet St. Innocent of Alaska. They just got, to, they were just in one place in, you know, middle of nowhere in Russia. I think in Yakutsk or somewhere like that. <laughs> and so, 63-year-old Fan Innocent, exper very experienced in missionary work. And 20-something Nikolai, young Nikolai, they were together. And Fan Innocent told young Nikolai that, learn the local language, learn how people live, and just spend your time to be immersed among the people in the culture. That's the only way you can start <coughs> doing any work. So he always remembered that. And so he lived in Hakodate for the first eight years, and back by then, things situation in Japan was a little bit different. So Christianity was a little bit more accepted, a little bit. There was still a lot of skepticism. <coughs> ah, something familiar. <laughs> so, so Father Nikolai moved to Tokyo in 1872. And of course he continued to do his missionary work. And many, many Japanese people into the Orthodox faith. And that, that the first building, the cathedral, Holy Resurrection Cathedral in Tokyo, and as known as Nikoraido. And you live there? Yes. Oh, yes. <laughs> okay. Yeah. We have some witness, witnesses <laughs> who live there. Yes. So that old picture is the first building. It was, it was severely damaged. In the, um, in the in the great Kanto earthquake in 1923, and they rebuilt the cathedral in 1929. So that's what it looks like to this day. Yes. So in 1880, Father Nikolai was elevated to the episcopacy, and he became archbishop. And uh, um, oh, there's a Sorry, there's a cutoff. 
So according to an internal survey, like according to the you know the census within the church, there were about yeah there were sixty nine six thousand ninety nine faithful and ninety six. 96 churches in Japan in 1880. So in 1880, we counted as 6,099 faithful and 96 churches. I mean, 96 churches, it's not like, you know, it's not um, all set up and, you know, fully, you know, full, filled with iconography like St. Mark's or, you know, other like, cathedral here. I mean, it's not like that. Small churches. You know, nonetheless, it's a church. You know, where people are, there's a church. And Saint Nikolai, he traveled everywhere in Japan, like literally everywhere. He has, he has a he. So he was writing, he he was writing his um, do you know, um, di diary. Yes, diary. And he was recording all the villages, every single corner of Japan, in his diary. And his diary was discovered, like, you know, 30 years ago or so, in the Soviet, <laughs> in the Soviet library. So now we have the, it's, it's all written in Russian, but it's translated into Japanese. I don't think it's translated in English, but at least we we could see what he was seeing. We kind of ex we can experience what he was experiencing back then through his diary. So he visited so many small places, and it's interesting in the, in the diary he he makes a lot of comments about everything, you know what people are doing right or what people are doing interesting. Maybe that's not a good idea to twist the music this way or that way. You know, he was very picky, very <laughs> peculiar, just like anybody in the church, you know. <laughs> but he was really observant and very encouraging. And he wanted to he wanted to educate people. So he spent a lot of time talking to families with children and asking those families to send children to the seminary in Tokyo. And we, but they gained a lot of seminaries, both male and female. And some, some of them, they went to study in Russia. Some of them, they, you know, started a, just a, they, some of them became catechists, and they just went all over the world, all over Japan, and spread the good news. So. So amongst all these people who were educated at the seminary in Tokyo, Saint Nikolai discovered some talents in translation. <coughs> you know, among seminarians and some people, some faithful. So, so that man next to Nikolai, there's a big gap. Apparently, Nikolai was a tall man. <laughs> so, and that's his assist, his translation assistant, Pavel Nakai Tsugumaro. He's from Osaka, he was from Osaka. So Pavel Nakai, he was educated in Chinese classics. He came from a very educated family. And he was able to help Saint Nikolai with his translation work, like to the greatest extent. I don't think um, without him, I don't think Nikolai, Saint Nikolai could do what he did without Pavel Nakai. Because you know, it, there's so much we can do just just by ourselves. We have to help with each other, and we really depend on each other's talent. And that's what Saint Nikolai did. And they, this team, this do this this duo, they worked every single day until the day that like, the, the day before Saint Nikolai died. Like, it was that important. Translation work for Saint Nikolai was that important. Because we have to start something, you know? I'm sure some people, some of you remember maybe Slavonic, you know? <laughs> Slavonic liturgy and and now we have a lot of things available in English. 
and so that we can understand what it what it said. So I put some pictures of Japanese liturgical text. You know, so you read from up to the bottom. You know, <laughs> up to the bottom, and. Thanks to these people, we have liturgical texts in Japanese, available in Japanese. What they did is just a really beyond remarkable, because, as you know, our Orthodox Church is particular, and the, the, the text, it has to encapsulate the ethos of Orthodox, Orthodoxy. You know, it can't be just just like anything. You know, it has to have a certain flavor, and they really worked hard to bring that Orthodox ethos into our liturgical texts. So they had to come up with some words that retained Orthodoxy, yet yet something that make, that would make sense to Japanese minds. So that's not easy. Yes, Father. Are his translations still in use, or have they been redone at all? Do you know? Good question. So, they're all in use. 150 years later, I go back to Japan almost every summer with the with family, go to church. It's the same. <laughs> it's the same. Yes. Certain pronunciations have been modified, but it's pretty much it has stayed the same for many years. Yes. And under St. Nicolai's direction, the Japanese church grew and faithful became <coughs> clergymen and catechists and St. Nicolai wanted a really solid person to succeed his mission work and he requested the Russian church to find him, somebody to succeed him. So that somebody is this, this man, Metropolitan Serge Tichomiro. Yes! He, he baptized me. You, she baptized you? Okay. That's so special. It was very special. That's very special. Yes. What a blessing. What a blessing. That's, that's really special. He used to hold me in his arms. Oh, oh okay. <laughs> That's so sweet. And yes. games with our brother. And I went to the first confession to him. To him? Yes. You see the history. There's like a living witness. A <laughs> witness. It's my goodness. Okay. What a blessing. So he, he came from Russia to really to do what, to continue the missionary work in Japan. And his life, as you know, was just was filled with struggles and trials. Yet he never gave up. He 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 brought more people into the faith, and he just he just did what he could because there were so many unfortunate <coughs> things surrounding his time. So Saint Nikolai died in nineteen eleven. Is that right? 1912, 1912. So he, he died 1912. And he was, he knew Metropolitan Sergei would take over and would do a wonderful job. So he was able to really let things go and leave us on this earth. And Metropolitan Sergei once he became the leader of our church, of the Orthodox Church of Japan, revolutions, Russian Revolution happened, and wars. The, the, the First World War and Second World War, Pacific War for Japanese people, it really tore the church apart. So the, the, you see all these men over there, there, you know, there are some people, some clergy, from various parts of Japan, I think they were they were there for like a, the Sobo Synod meeting, something like that. That was taken in 1895. That that drew 
way more, <laughs> maybe double or triple by the time Metropolitan Sergei this then started his leadership. But the 1930s, 1940s was a very, very rough time for the Church of Japan. And, and unfortunately, Metropolitan Sergei died a few days before the war ended for Japan. Remember? Did, I think, I don't remember. Okay, that's what <laughs> Yeah, I think that's, so I think he was put on house, under house arrest, right? Mm -hmm. it, it was very unfortunate. And so yeah, 1945, he, he died, unfortunately. And, um, you know, the, the, well, he died, yet. The Church of Japan still existed. You know, there were people involved in church. There were people believing in Christ. So they had to carry on. So what happened? In 1947, the Orthodox Church of Japan became part of the metropolia, what is now Orthodox Church in America as a result of the loss of loss in the Pacific War. So the Church of Japan, we welcomed hierarchs coming from America. And we started rebuilding the church. And they, the hierarchs from America, um, Archbishop, um, I think it was Bishop Benjamin, Bishop Irene, all, all these people, they were, they had to see the, the reality. You know, after the war, the country was devastated. The poverty stricken, it just people didn't have anything. So they had to do what they could and you know bring some so, some kind of normalcy to their lives. Yes. And you know, with God's grace, they were able to rebuild a lot of things, including these, you know, that Annunciation Cathedral in Sendai. It was actually bombed. The first building was bombed during the war. They rebuilt the church, and now it's standing. It's very. It's right in the downtown Sendai. So, <laughs> buildings, 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 and all of a sudden you see this church. And the one far right, that's Annunciation Church in Magata Akita. It's it's in the middle of nowhere. Middle of nowhere. It's a very tiny church, and I'm sorry I didn't have a, um, <coughs> any picture of inside. They have a really sweet iconostasis painted by um, Japanese iconographer, Irina Yamashita. So even in this corner of nowhere in Japan, the Orthodox Church still exists. And then this is the Nanseishin Cathedral in Kyoto. They're all Annunciation. We like the name Annunciation because you know it's good news. You know, <laughs> so, and see, Annunciation Cathedral in Tokyo, uh, Kyoto, is also located in a really prime place, prime area. So these churches are all over in Japan. Every, I would say, in any any major city, each prefecture has an Orthodox church. So, the Church of Japan has experienced many trials, you know, at the beginning, persecution, and wars, poverty, internal conflict, you know, where people are, there's politics. So, just like any church on this earth, you know, but they have persevered, and there's still many talented individuals, and we still have we still exist. You know, we're not we're not big, but we still exist. Um, that music, that's that's um, the angel cried, <coughs> originally written by composed by Ma Makarov. Makarov, yes. The angel cried to the That was the 
that was put into Japanese text by Mr. Victor Kukrovsky, your father. <laughs> yes. So that's how it goes. He stayed out right. <laughs> learning the language and yes. you know, translating right. and rewriting the music. Rewriting, yes. So <coughs> Mr. Victor Pokrovsky is one of the major, major influence for church and the church of music in Japan. He, your father, <laughs> the, the uh, um, Larissa, Lydia Larissa's father, <coughs> he did so much work to bring, you know, to, to translate from Russian to, to Slavon, from Slavonic to Japanese. And um, we still use them, we still use them. And these are the pictures of our friends. Um, that's my, that we attended a wedding, Orthodox wedding, two years ago in Yokohama, church in Yokohama. So the, 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 the groom, he went to St. Vlad, St. Vlad and Moses or seminary. So, and my husband and the groom, Mr. Shojin, they were classmates. And we were we happened to be in Japan for their wedding, and our friend Machka Maria, who is also a friend with you, <laughs> is Nick and Melanie. She she was there too. So our church, the Orthodox Church in Japan, is a small small. It's almost like a family. It's an autonomous church under the Russian Orthodox Church since 1970, and currently we have 58 churches and 26 clergy. And they now have about 500 to 600 regular attendees any given Sunday throughout the country. So it's, it, it is small. And like I said at the beginning, you know, I grew up in, in church. I was, I was unusual. But there are some, I'm not the only person on YouTube. <laughs> so there is a comfort in that. And um, I think that's, that's all I need to, oh, yes. May I ask, how is it that you were born as an Orthodox Christian, your parents? Yes. And how did they come about? Yes, so that's Christian? a very question. Thank you. I should have mentioned it. <laughs> so how I became Orthodox, it, the Orthodox Orthodoxy came into my family through my father. And today, I opened the bulletin that I, you know, here to, tonight. And there's a hagiography of St. Joseph, the iconographer. That's my father's saint. <laughs> because guess what? He was baptized on this day, um, uh, on the day of his, uh, St. Joseph, the, the hymnographer. 58 years ago. <laughs> so what happened was, my father met an Orthodox priest, Father Yohan Kriagawa, who was teaching social studies in my, my father's high school. And Father Yohan was a, a, he was a character. He, he told, you know, his students to come and, come and help. So the, the, the couple boys came to help, and it was church. And then Matsuka fed them, and the boys kept coming. And then after my father graduated from high school, he, you know, he had a blessing from his mother and his parents, and then they, he became Orthodox. And after my father became Orthodox, his mother, my grandmother, became Orthodox. Mm -hmm. And one, two, three, four, five of his siblings. He's the youngest of nine, by the way. Yeah. Five of the five older siblings, they became Orthodox. And my mother became Orthodox when they got married. And I had no choice. So, <laughs> yes. So but that's how. But it's it's you know, this is my home parish. And it when my father was in high school, the church was in a very 
sad state. So the, the, they didn't have any money. They didn't have any money and the, 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 the exterior wall, they were broken. They needed a lot of, lot of work. They had no, no pavement around the church. It was all muddy kind of road. Hence, all these high school boys, they were brought in to, hey, you know, do some work. <laughs> and I think my father it was just struck by this beauty in, you know, of the church inside, you know, iconostasis and iconography. And he just thought it was a good thing to just be part of it. So, very simple. Yes. So this is, this, that's my story. Thank you for asking. Yes. Yes. Any questions? Yeah, how, yes. is, how is it growing at this point? Like, and, and maybe you mentioned this, I, I don't remember, but how compared to, when I was there, I met missionaries and um, never any Orthodox missionaries. Um, this was, um, you know, 30 years ago, but how is it growing at this point, um, you know, present day? Well, present day, so it's, we don't really have a mission mission. We do open the church always and we do have a lot of people come and go. Yet, um, so, how should I put it? So there are a lot of Western influence in Japan, yes. Um, there are a lot of academic institutions in Japan that were established by missionaries. And we do have Catholic universities, we have Episcopalian universities, we have you know, a lot of Protestant universities. But that was not the case for our church because of many financial trials. And I think with that, it's just, it's been very difficult to, to really establish something, you know, to anchor something very strong. Even though this church is so well known, <laughs> Everybody knows that church, but not many people know what it is, what's happening inside of this church. So we try some publicity, you know, we try to do some, you know, we try to do some Christmas prayer service open to everybody. It's work in progress. Any questions? Yes. Do you know, are most of the current clergy, are they native Japanese, or are they, you know? Yes, yes. You know, as a matter of fact, I think they're all Japanese now. We did have one, two, <coughs> even three um, non-Japanese clergy. But right now, they're all Japanese. Yes. I mean, some people, so there, there are, well, you know what, clergy, Mr. Fanalakis, he's, well, he's Japanese, <laughs> you know. <laughs> we do have a deacon in Tokyo who is half Greek, yeah, 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 and half Korean, but he, he's Japanese, <laughs> yes, yes. So yeah, yes, so it's pretty much Japanese, yes. Yes. So yes, there is a seminary in Tokyo. Be, um, between 1945, uh, 47, and, nine, uh, and up until 19, probably so, sometime in 1970s, we did have a lot of people who studied at St. Blas. Yeah, St. Blas or St. Econ's. But now most people just go to um, seminary in Tokyo. Yeah, it's, it's small, but it's there. And we do have some academic, you know, academic people who can teach different subjects. So yes. Did I answer your question? Okay. Yes. yes. How do you say Christ is risen in Japanese? Oh, Haristos Hukat. Again, please. Haristos Hukat. Yes, this is Hukat. Yes. Haristos Hukat, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. 
So maybe that's 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 the that's the homework for you for this you know well that's the homework for Father Gregory <laughs> because he has to the, he has to be the one to say I suppose with us then you you say Jesus with us yes tell me tell them what Lord have mercy is in Japan. Lord have mercy that's Shu Aware Me yeah Shu Aware Me yes Shu Aware Me yes yes yes. Yes. Okay, thank <laughs> <laughs> well, yes. you. This, this is an aside, but I'm just wondering if people got this email from the Orthodox Church in Osaka. Ah. Father, did you? Who sent this? This is uh -huh. on March 24th. Help restore Epitaphios by Petro Sataki, Japanese. Yes, Polish. okay. Oh, that's, that's very good. Yes, yes, yeah, so you got the email. To they're trying mm -hmm. to raise money. Mm -hmm. They need about three thousand five hundred dollars. What? Um, <laughs> we're undertaking a project to restore our Epipapios, a cherished icon created over sixty years ago by renowned Japanese Finnish iconographer Petro Sasaki. We're seeking donations to reach our goal of five hundred thousand Japanese yen, which is approximately thirty-five hundred dollars via Kickstarter. With your help, we can preserve this invaluable piece of religious heritage. Through this project, we seek to both preserve this icon, which has been damaged over the years, and bring more attention to the beloved iconographer, Petro Sasaki, sharing his life and work, um, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and there's more information. Um, we would appreciate if you'd share this information with your parish community. Um, and if possible, please forward this email to other parishes. So this was all done by um, the church in Osaka. Osaka. Yeah, church in Osaka, yes. Orthodox so, Church, Father Reverend George uh, Matsushima. Yeah. Matsushima. Yes. Matsushima. So, so there's a, there's this, thank you, because that's, there is a Japanese iconographer who went to Mount Athos first, and then he, stu he, stu he studied iconography, and then he went to Finland, and he stayed there, he got married there, and he did a lot of iconography work in the Finnish Orthodox Church. That's a Japanese man, Petro Sasaki, yes. And the church in uh, Osaka, um, Pokrov Church, the Protection Church, he, they, they have his epitaphios, it's Prasenica winding sheet? Yes. Yes, they, and they want to restore it. So they want to, yeah, and then there's a page, so maybe Father, you can, you can, I didn't. I don't think so. Maybe I just got it because of the Matushka. I think so. I think so. I'll forward it to you, and then maybe you can forward it to everybody. Yes. Yes. So the so the churches. Thank you so much because the churches in Japan. You know, you asked how, what kind of mission work, you know, what what's happening right now. We're trying everything, we can, to really you know bring some attention to us because it's kind of our church has been kind of buried. It's a good one. Yeah, period. Yes, not much publicity. So this is great. Yes, so thank you. Yes, Paul. In your presentation, you had noted at one point historically about 6,000 something, yes. you know, parishioners, mm -hmm. Orthodox Christians, mm -hmm. rather. And that was way back. I just wondered mm -hmm. if you have any idea now what the size of the church So, is. so the sense, the, the, when you, <coughs> we do census every year, and it's like, you know, 9,000 people, 8,000, 9,000. But the reality is, anywhere like, you know, any church, you have, you know, okay, 600 families, but only 100 people, 100 to 150 people are active, like on a regular basis. Yes. So it's just like that, yes. And it's, there are a lot of places struggling. <laughs> we had a presentation last week from uh, His Grace Bishop Alexia of the Diocese of Alaska. So, in my mind, I'm trying to equate a little bit the uh, ratio or size of what is there now and what is in Japan now. And of course, because St. Innocent and St. Nikolai were, you know, kind of contemporaries in a way, although separated by a few years. Um, and I think that some of the struggles 
of the church in Alaska and perhaps in Japan initially were similar because of the language issue. Uh, and then, of course, the acculturation of Christianity, Orthodox Christianity, into the, the culture causes it to really be embraced more deeply. But then the spread of it, see, in other words, is a, is a bit problematic because in Alaska, I mean, are we only a native Alaskan church? We're not, you know, that's the thing. So in, in Japan, of course, it's a different situation. It's a pretty homogenous culture, mm -hmm. right? So I'm just wondering, you know, you mentioned that it's kind of like not known very much kind of very um, among the leaders in Japan now is their discussion about trying to kind of, or are they allowed even to, to sort of try to proselytize a little bit? I think so. I, I think that I think they, they are, well, it's, of course it's allowed, and of course they are, like people, you know, Father George Matsushima and Matsushima Maria in Osaka, the people like that. Yeah, good people. They, they, there are people, individuals, and all the clergy, they're trying to bring more attention, you know, do what they can. In the meantime, um, the, the Japanese culture as a whole, it's very secular. And, and I'm not probably doing any justice by saying secular because it's a different secular kind of, you know, setting. Japan, has a long history of doing things on their own, like you know, making things to you know on their own. And for any kind of foreign entity to come and making their entity as uh, no, as Japanese, that's a, a taking a long time, and it's just not it, it's the process of enculturation. But I think it, we're in the pro, it, we're, it's in a progress, and you know, in the process, in the middle of the process. It's been only 150 years, you know? Orthodoxy in Japan, uh, in, in the States, you know, in mainland, of, you know, North America, that's not that long either, you know? So we're in, we're, all of us, we're in the process of making it into our own. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yes. Yes. So we'll see. I, I don't think we need to, I think there's some hopes, you know? Definitely. Yes. Any other questions, comments? You must have answered every problem. Okay. <laughs> okay. So thank you. Thank you.